Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing in our series, Destiny of the Prototokos. Scripture teaches the Prototokos are those whom the Father called from eternity before the era of time. Turn to Ephesians, the first chapter, verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So the Prototokos are the preeminent group the Father has called before <coughs> the creation came into being, before time was initiated. Now, Scripture teaches. It was at this point when the Father called that the Father determined to give to the Prototokos all things. In 1 Corinthians, 2nd chapter, verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So, <clears throat> the Father's estates, his heritage, the things that he would bequeath to the sons that he had called, <clears throat> were brought forth at this time, and kept secret. When the human race was created and spawned, <clears throat> they had no idea of the things that pertained to this preeminent group. Angels were not privy to the things that the Father had predestined the sons to inherit. Which brings us to the <clears throat> next scripture. Ephesians, the first chapter, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, turn to Psalms, 33rd chapter. There, Jimmy? Yes. Okay. Psalms 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. And we put these two scriptures together, we get a picture that when the Father spoke the heavens into existence, and all that it pertained to them, he, he, in a time in which he called those who were destined to be part of the Prototokos group, those very heavens would become their possession, their inheritance. 
nobody knew. The angels, thrones, dominions, principalities did not know that one day there would come a time in which there were bugs, the dominions would come under the administration of the sons of God, of the Prototokis group. Which brings us to the next principle. Scripture teaches this would include all the Luciferian dominions and kingdoms. Revelation, second chapter, verse 26 to 27. Okay, buddy, there. You there, Jimmy? Mm -hmm. Okay. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. <clears throat> and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter, so they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. Now the nations that he is referring to comprise the Luciferian dominions and all the intelligences that he would ultimately dominate. Turn to Ezekiel, 31st chapter. Verse 16. Ezekiel 31, verse 16. Oh, wrong book. You want Ezekiel? Yes. My head's on my head. Ezekiel 31. 31. You get there at verse 16. Okay, got it. I made the nations to shake at the sound of its wall. The nations are the masses that Lucifer dominated prior to his being cast <coughs> down to hell. I made the nations to shake at the sound of its wall when I cast them down to hell, with them to descend into the pit, and all the trees of Eden, the choice and the best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the neither parts of the earth. So the nations are going to become the inheritance of the prototokian group. This was determined by the Father before the formation of time, before the formation of the Eretz region, secondary creation, fatherhood predetermine this beforehand. Yes. Pardon my human expression, but that's <coughs> from what I understand about them, I'm not really interested in inheriting them. Well, it ha has to do with <coughs> the father knew 
what would happen. And putting it in the hands of the sons as an inheritance of all that the Father has brought forth, it's going to glorify him, not us. We're going to, he's going to use the prototokis to clean up the mess okay. so that he gets the glory. glory. Which is the next principle. Scripture teaches this would include all that is currently under control of the non-fallen intelligences also. So in Hebrews, second chapter, verse 5. For unto the angels have ye not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. Now you remember when we read Psalms 33, he spoke, the heavens came into existence in all that pertained to them. In other words, initially, immediately, thrones, dominions, principalities came into existence with the comprehension of the dominion status that they were created to manifest. What the scripture is saying is that in the age to come, the millennial age, their authority will be superseded by the sons of God. You will be directing and judging their activities. And to return to the Father's put all things into the hands of the Son who will distribute all things to his brothers. Whether they're fallen angels or whether they're loyal angels. This includes YHVH. Interesting. <clears throat> Next principle. Scripture teaches the Prototokos members have levels of spiritual comprehension. So as in every other aspect, there is going to be a hierarchy of levels in the Prototokos group. We see this illustrated in the lives of the disciples. Turn to Mark, 14th chapter, verse 32 to 33. Thirty-two to thirty-three, and they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. So all the disciples come with Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he saith to his disciples, "Sit ye here while I shall pray." He tells them to sit down, and he taketh with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy, and saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death, tarry ye here and watch. So all the disciples, with the exception of Peter, James, and John, are sitting in a certain place, and then Jesus goes to another place and takes three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John, with him. Why? Because he needed somebody that had a high level of spirituality to be with him at that time. This is a, yes. Why was he amazed? Oh, because of the things that were happening within him. Right. He wasn't amazed at the members. No, okay. it had nothing to do with them. Right. He's going through his final uh, agony of going to the cross. And things that are happening within him, the knowledge, primarily he is totally affected by the knowledge that he's going to be separated from the Father. Mm. How many levels should we understand that there are within the protection of the Well, we're going to give some illustration of the existence of levels, but that, how many is another 
for another time. Turn to Matthew 17, verses 1 to 2. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. So Jesus takes these three, whenever there is something that is spiritually significant, deep in other words, because he understands that these three have the ability to receive and comprehend, the others don't. Just out of interest, would you say that the members around this table have the equal capacity to receive what you just said? Uh, yes. Okay. But, but, we're going to go into a principle dealing with this, but, God does all things wisely. Everybody has the same capacity, but, it is the willingness to allow the fullness of the capacity to come forth, which is going to determine the level at which the prototokis group winds up. And I, uh, I'm just going to add this, and I'm thinking just like the waters recognizing Lucifer's potential, it says the waters favored him, gave the, the most of themselves to him, which made him great. And I believe it's a, it's, it's, it's a similar, and I want you to correct me if I'm incorrect in assuming this, that the more you show the Father your ability to back off from your self-preservation, your dying to self-mannerism, and seeking his kingdom and your inheritance and pleasing him, He's give you more. Exactly. He'll give you more. Exactly. Exactly. It is a, the, the, the final say so has to do with the will of the individual. Well, let's go on. So we see Peter, James, and John were the inner circle. Jesus would favor them with things that would be considered radical. Uh, revolutionary, uh, the revelation that he would want his disciples to see, to understand, would always start with Peter, James, and John. Now, the same thing was true. We said, uh, matter of fact, turn to the Gospel of John, 17th chapter. We want to establish something. It did say in the scripture that John was Jesus' brother. John? Peter, James, and John? That John? Jesus' brother. So the same brother. John? So I'm, that's what I'm looking for in your correction right now. No. That's a different John. No, because uh, James and John were brothers whose father was Zebedee. Okay, okay so it says, after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up to a high mountain apart. Right. So James and John is what they're referring right. to. Uh, John what? Chapter 17th chapter. Okay. Verses 5 to 6. <clears throat> okay. You there, Jimmy? Yeah. Okay. Now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory of which I had with thee before the world was. I manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. So these are the prototokis. And Jesus is giving us the understanding. They belong to the Father. Why do they belong to the Father? Because he called them, he chose them in eternity. And then he gave them to the Son in, in temporality to develop the fullness of sonship is exactly what's happened to all of us. Mm -hmm. We belong to the Father, 
Then when we, when we come into the new birth experience, we become the sons to develop as brethren. Now I'm saying this to show you that there are levels of advancement, levels of maturity within the prototokers group based on the willingness of each one to totally yield to the new birth within them. Now, am I saying this? Because Paul illustrates the supremacy of this. Go to Galatians, first chapter, verses 11 to 12. Galatians, the first chapter, verses 11 to 12. Everyone there? There, Jimmy? Yeah. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul is on a higher level in the Prototokius group than even the other 11. Why? Because Paul has the mindset and willingness to go for broke and to receive everything that the Lord has for him. So we can see then there are, there are at least three levels. <coughs> Paul, <coughs> the inner circle, and then the rest of the group. Do you agree with that? Uh, well, you could say um, the disciples constitute a particular level. The apostles constitute a particular level. After the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, they were all on the same level. You just explained how Paul is now at a higher level to the rest. Than those that were on the apostles' level. Okay. And why is that? I'll give you an understanding of why that is. Second Peter, third chapter, verse fourteen to sixteen. Peter's just got through describing the end of this age with the elimination of this physical creation in vivid terms. He talks about it's going to go out of existence in a fire which will consume all things. Then he goes on, picking it up in verses 14 to 16, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent. She may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of those things in which are some things hard to be understood, <clears throat> which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Peter acknowledges the wisdom that Paul has is difficult to comprehend. Paul is looking from the totality of revelation that's been given to him. Peter, the other apostles, are looking at at Revelation from a human Jewish perspective. Paul says, I was a Pharisee, I was a Pharisee to Pharisees, and I know all about that stuff, and I've made it decide because I see something that's far beyond that. Peter and the other apostles never reached that point. Therefore, right. their comprehension <clears throat> of the mindset of the Prototokius inheritance is greatly lessened. You have to be willing to lay it all aside from the human perspective and embrace all from God's perspective 
in the degree that you do, you're going to be on a high, high, high level. You will reach a stage where the inner man will begin to dominate your thoughts, your perception of life. Scripture teaches the Holy Spirit is given to show the prototokos their inheritance. Go back to 1 Corinthians, second chapter, verse 10. And we're going to cover some things here. 1 Corinthians, second chapter, verse 10. Jimmy? Yeah. Okay. For God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep <coughs> things of God. So Paul is declaring that the, what the Father has reserved for the Prototokos group from eternity is now made available to those who will desire to proceed and to pursue it. Now, go to Galatians, first chapter again. What chapter? Galatians, the first chapter. Okay. We're going to read verses 15 to 17. Everybody there? Okay. When it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. So Paul is saying the revelation that he got was not given to him from the other apostles and everything to do with the other apostles. It was given him directly from the Lord Jesus. He didn't confer with the other apostles about this until after he solidified his consummation of knowledge of the revelations. I went back into Arabia, and I stayed there until I reached the stage. Basically, what he's saying is I reached the stage of understanding this new revelation. Then I went back to Jerusalem. So Paul goes back, and he presents the gospel that he had been given by the Lord to the other apostles. And what was the response? That is crazy. He's not an apostle. He's not genuine. What is this stuff he's talking about? He was not received. Why? Because he didn't present it in the way in which the other apostles would have received it. He wanted to, they wanted him to do it from a continuation of a Jewish perspective. And then Paul's <laughs> talking about things of eternity that they weren't ready. And they, they believe me, they had gotten comprehension of understanding from the Lord himself in 40 days. And then he went back to heaven and left them with the mandate to spread the gospel, which they were doing, or they thought they were doing to the max. And then along comes Paul with this new revelation. They had a choice. They could receive it, pursue it, add to what they knew, or reject it, which is exactly what they did. It was not until Paul began establishing churches along with the Gentiles. They went back to Jerusalem. They had this huge convocation. Paul authenticated his apostleship by signs and wonders. And they saw the same things happening to the Gentiles that were happening to the Jews. But Paul was going a step further. He was incorporating this new 
doctrine to the Gentiles, the Jews weren't. So the prototoke is shifting from the Jews to the Gentiles, as God determined that it was supposed to be. Now, by shift, are you saying included? No, I mean shift. As in left the Jews and encapsulated in, in only the Gentiles? Yes. Only the Gentiles? Yes. That's interesting. See, I, I wanted to interrupt and, and say, you know, can you imagine that if you're part of the, the core group, and then your master dies, and then this new guy shows up, and he starts tell, telling you a little bit more than you've already known, because you walked with Jesus. Yeah. How how does that even survive? How does that even how does it even happen that way? And then the whole thing is, the Jews are called God's chosen people. Okay, yeah, that's what they're called. But it seems like the Gentiles are getting the lion's share of this. Right. Comprehension. So, explain it to me. Just before you go any further, at that point, at that stage where race is saying the Gentiles are getting the lion's share, do you think the Jews understood the reason why the Gentiles were getting the lion's share? No. They had no comprehension. No. They were, they were, um, um, the basically critical of it. Because they had been taught for generations and generations, the Gentiles were beneath the Jew. Don't have anything to do with them. And the, the Lord was trying to get the disciples for three and a half years to understand that the gospel was to go to everybody. It was for everybody else because the Jews had rejected it. Mm. So any Ephesians, That's the point. So any because Ephesians, the Jews had rejected, rejected it. And they rejected it. Exactly what yeah. you said. So any Ephesians, the second. So it's like double trouble, really, isn't it? Well, it all can be laid to one one reason: human thinking. Yeah. Ephesians. Ephesians, the second chapter. Ephesians, the third chapter. Third chapter. This is the third chapter, starting in verse 1, and we're going to read down to verse 7. Everyone there? For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of, you, of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, <clears throat> if you have heard of the dispensation, or the word actually, since you have heard the dispensation of the grace of God, <clears throat> which is given me to you, word, the Gentiles, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four and few words. So this is specifically a message to the Gentiles the true prototokos. Whereby, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, and this is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So what we read before in 1 Corinthians, God had predetermined the prototokos would inherit all things. That was hidden until the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, until the establishment of the church. Paul writes to the church, now these things are revealed. And he's going on. He talks about unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. He's writing to the Gentile <coughs> church. So what prophets and apostles is he talking about? The Gentile prophets and apostles of the body of Christ is now revealed. What's the mystery that's been revealed? <clears throat> that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. 
whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the insensible riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So he's talking about the mandate has shifted from the Jews to the Gentiles. The Jews can still get into it, uh, become part of it, but they can't as a nation. And he goes on to talk about that in Corinthians, that God has separated the nation of Israel, blindness has come upon them, they will not uh, avail themselves of this. So it's shifting to the Gentiles. And the Jews are coming into a comprehension of it as individuals, not as connected to the nation and the state of Israel. Can you just very quickly outline the understanding of replacement theology based on what you've just said? Oh, replacement theology, that's, that's something totally different. Okay. Is that a nonsense? It's essence? nonsense, okay. yeah, because they're talking about a uh, guy that has uh, basically, <clears throat> uh, he's through with Israel, that right. they, they have no longer <clears throat> anything, any part in God's program or <clears throat> God's destiny or anything along that line, and now everything is in the, the church. That's radically different. What we're talking about is the call from eternity of the Prototokis group mm -hmm. and how it develops in temporality. God foresaw that the mandate would shift from Israel to the Prototokis group because Israel voluntarily would reject it. As a nation. But as a nation, but as individuals, right. yes, wide open to them, okay. yes. So, I'm assuming, obviously, there is going to be Jewish <coughs> Protokos group members. Yes, definitely, definitely. But as individuals, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. No, but the whole nation of Israel shall be uh, uh, preaching the word of God to and uh, offering salvation. During the tribulation period? Yes. Long after the church is taken off the earth. They're missing. They're going to miss it. They're going to get in at the, at the end of the age. During the tribulation period, there is still sacrifice as well. Now, do you think this is going to happen surely because they see the actual evidence of the church being taken from, from the earth. In other words, they recognize they messed up a little bit. Here's no, the proof. No. And we better get, no, they're get gonna back see in it, Israel, Because Israel at the time that the rapture takes place will be steeped in the, <clears throat> in the reestablished mosaic right. ritualistic okay. law. They're gonna, what you're saying. they're gonna come around through the ministry of other Jews, the two witnesses. Mm -hmm. And then 144,000. And then a high dose of persecution during the tribulation <coughs> at the hands of the Antichrist, the beast. Yes. How, is it fair for us to assume the 144,000 are Messianic Jews? Yes. Oh, yes. They're called the first fruits. In other words, they are the first of the nation to receive the Messiah. Twelve tribes. Twelve thousand of each tribe. Then, then again, it has nothing to do. With, they have nothing to do with the prototokis, yeah. Because number one, they won't make the rapture, and they'll be on a, they'll be part of the general assembly. Now, the mandate at this point is in the hands of the Gentile prototokis, and. Actually, when you take a look at it, you very few to prototokis even aware. They have to be waking up. So I could send more emails. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I thought you'd say that. Yes. If you take a look at the state of the church today, they don't have a clue about what we're talking about. Uh -huh. And the majority of it throw cold water on. Uh -huh. 
what we're talking about. And yeah. they preach other things. Yeah, because they're, you're under the Luciferian influence. The blinders are still on. And the leadership, right? God. I call it the major on the minors. They, te they keep te teaching the same thing over and over and over with a little additional, you know, uh, scriptures or something they heard somebody else say and added in their study. Well, well, I'll add that in, and, and so I'm changing it up. The thing it is, it's, it's, a, it's a ritualistic Christian um, way, and it's not pleasing. To Americanized, time. homogenized, materialistic. Christianity. Well, the thing that I recall they were teaching was that uh, they're going to have those uh, red heifers, <coughs> and uh, that was more important. And, and then the temple was coming back, and all these things. When we have, and I can see that we have everything. Yeah. We don't need the temple or the red heifers and they're not where we're supposed to be. No, the Jews the Jews are still under the Yahweh covenant. That's all they can see. They're blinded. The scripture tells us that. When they rejected Jesus, he spoke of them. He said, These things are not hid from you. The tremendous suffering that they were going to have to undergo because of their own Blind. Well, actually, they were willing to let the leadership lead them down the path to destruction. And this is exactly what they did. Now, of course, the leadership was uh, basically engineered by Satan. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus pronounced sins on them. He said that um, you're going to literally experience um, an unbelievable <coughs> uh, tribulation because of your unwillingness to receive the truth. So then how is it that the leadership, because it's clear in the Bible, they know who he is. And we know they know who he is because they said, if we allow this man to continue doing what he's doing, we're going to lose our place. Sure. They didn't really know who he is. In other words, his potential is what I'm trying to get at. They didn't really understand what he was bringing. Otherwise, surely they would have you know, looked at the long game as opposed to trying to protect their positions. No. Uh, because <clears throat> it says many believed on him. Mm. But they wouldn't confess <clears throat> it. It said Jesus knew that the high priest, Caiaphas, and his nephew knew who he was. He was the Messiah. And he spoke parables about that. He said that uh, <clears throat> in uh, Luke 19, he talks about <clears throat> the citizens hated him. So we will not have this man rule, rule over us. And he talks about them wanting to get rid of him so they could take the inheritance for themselves. So they knew. The leadership knew who he was, and they deliberately engineered his death because they wanted to continue to control Israel themselves. And, of course, you can see Satan doing all this. Yes. As a matter of fact, the scripture tells about Zechariah that the time will come when they will understand what they did, and they're going to spend a long, long, long time regretting it. They will see him. And it said that it will reach a point where it will go down to in the, the nation will mourn, it will go down to individuals. They're literally going to cover themselves with sackcloth and ashes, weeping bitterly because they'll understand what, what they allowed to happen. Now, does gnashing of teeth come into that weeping? No, no that's torment. This is, <laughs> this is uh, referring to uh, sorrow mm. for transgressing. And then, of course, added to that, you're going to see the prototokens operating, the sons of God. And you're going to see, they're going to find out, they're going to understand what it was they allowed to slip through their fingers. But doesn't that come down to whether they were called or they weren't called? Because yeah. surely, and the reason I'm saying this is because mm -hmm. if they were called, it may take a few times you know, to get knocked on the head by the Lord, but they will understand that they've been called and they'll go about their business. Why would that be the case? There's a heavenly call, which is the prototokis, okay. and there's an earthly call. Israel had an earthly call because they are damnings. Right. But let's go on. Mm -hmm. okay. 
Scripture teaches those who yield <coughs> to the desires of the new creation fully will become the Lord's inner circle. Again, we say, <coughs> when the call is realized and it's pursued to its fullest, then the Holy Spirit will bear witness with the inner man, the new spirit creation, and the, and the desires of the new spirit creation will dominate the life. <coughs> this is the major principle of who is going to be at the top of the prototokis hierarchy and who win, won't. The, the willingness of the mind to yield to the desires of the spirit fully will become the Lord's inner circle, seated on his right hand. In Revelation, the third chapter, verse 21. We covered this briefly at the last session. Revelation 3, verse 21. Everybody there? Oh, we'll wait. Yes. We'll wait. Yes. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. There's only one throne, actually, but the Lord differentiates this point between his throne and the father's throne. And he says, I overcame and sat down with my father in his throne, therefore it becomes my throne. The person that overcomes will sit with me in my throne. Now, when is that going to happen? Because when you read the book of Revelation, <clears throat> Jesus isn't even pictured as seated on the throne. He's always pictured as standing. He's always pictured as doing something. The only one pictured seated is the Father's. So everybody is seated in the Father's throne. When then is this going to happen where we get seated with Jesus in his throne? Before the rapture. You say, well, how is that possible? <clears throat> if you become part of his inner circle, notice what it says, or what's written here anyway. Those who yield to the desires of the new creation fully will become the Lord's inner circle seated on his right hand. To be at the right hand means that you'll be at, as part of his inner circle. Turn to Revelation, the first chapter, verse 20. Revelation, the first chapter, verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand. So he's got these seven stars in his right hand. The scripture tells us that Jesus is in the Father's right hand. It means you're at the closest position you can be in Christ. Christ is the closest position you can be in the Father. Therefore, the right hand signifies the intimacy, the closeness of the relationship. Seven stars <coughs> have achieved this relationship. The mystery of the seven stars which thou source in my right hand. What are the seven stars? <clears throat> and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The seven candlesticks which thou source are the seven churches. What's being said it's being said that the seven churches that he mentions <coughs> which are Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These are seven churches. Each church has an angel which is over it. We want to break this down a little more. Now, the angels that are over the churches, how did they get there? And who are they? Turn back to Revelation 
22nd chapter. When you get to Revelation 22nd chapter, we want verses 8 to 9. And I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel would show me these things. Everybody clear on that? Mm -hmm. What did he do? He fell down to worship at the foot of this angel. What does the angel tell him? Then saith he to me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. So the angel is not an angel, the angel is a saint. It comes from the human race. Turn to Revelation 21st chapter. I mean Revelation in 19th chapter. The angels are saints. Are they all members of the Prototipus group? Yes. Okay. <coughs> Revelation 19, verses 9 and 10. Everyone there? He saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. Again, falls at the feet of the angel to worship him. And he saith unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant. And of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. It's not an angel, it's a saint. Of these two distinct events. Mm hmm Okay. Yes, they happen twice. It's the same angel. It's the same angel? Yes. Now, what we want... Sorry, why would he okay. worship the same angel twice? Why would he be confused about that? They all look the same? What, what's the, the thinking? Because he's caught up with the glory of what this angel is capable of doing in his life. Only God can do that. has this type of potential. Remember, this is John. Said it, laid his head on Jesus' breast for three and a half years. This is John the Beloved. He walked with Jesus. Talk with Jesus. Yet and still, he's awed for the glory of this angel. Wow. <coughs> now, we want... I have a feeling that the glory is a, is a feature that it, it's not recognizable as anything other than God because the glory is so magnificent. So, great. And so you know, his... Human consciousness is okay. This, um, the, you know, this has to be God. You know, I mean, the brilliance is so. And, and, and to see it twice, see, I, I've struggled with that as well. Mm. How could you do it the same? How could you make the same mistake twice? Well, right. the thing of it is, the glory must be so intense and so confidently reassuring. That you're in, you're in the holy presence. It has to be God. And then, then he then he gets corrected, and you know, it's blown my mind the things that I understand about scripture and the things that I still don't understand. But the thing is, is the Jews and the Gentiles thing, you know, the chosen people. They will not by what we understand. They're not the chosen people. The Gentiles are because right. they're getting lion's share. And Paul, you know. He's sent to the Gentiles. He's not sent to the Jews. Actually, he was teaching the Jews as well, but right. primarily to the Jew, the Gentiles. Mm. It's like, okay, so I can understand this. I'm struggling as a Christian with the, with the understanding of what's going on. Yes. And to anybody that isn't sitting at a table having the same experiences that we are, it would make no sense. There's no chance yeah. for it to, to conclude anything but nonsense. Right. And I just realizing tonight that when Paul speaks to Jews, it's like Richard said, they're individuals. Mm. It's not 
the uh, the church, yeah. right? It's not, and it's not the nation. Hmm. It's individuals, and individuals can accept. Absolutely, and that's how it will happen. Which right, he pointed out to us. It's happening. Yeah, great insight. Turn to Matthew, the twenty-second chapter. Picking it up, and get there, verse 28, down to verse 30. There. Scribes and Pharisees ask Jesus a question about the resurrection. A man married, a woman married several men, whose wife would she be? We're picking up verse 28. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said, You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God. So men will have an angelic glory that is conferred to them from the resurrection. The first part of the resurrection is what we call a rapture. So what John sees and this glorified saint is an angelic glory. It's a word that in the Greek which, which means angel-like. This is conferred, a glory conferred in the resurrection. And at the highest parameter of existence, John sees a saint with this high glory. And he's calling the saint an angel from the beginning on to where he's corrected. Yeah. Yes. So, the new millennium, when there are, are even the tribulation period, the thousand year reign, let's do the millennium, there will be more humans being born. Will there be marriages? Mm -hmm. There will be marriages. On earth, yes. All right. So, this is relegated only in heaven. Yeah, in heaven, they don't marry nor give any marriage. So, this is purely. What you're referring to after glorification is what I'm understanding. No, um, this is the start of the glorification process. Men will have the glory of angels. Talking about the resurrection. Okay. After resurrection, <clears throat> men are going to be raised to a position of glory. And a position of glory will be, in, there's a Greek term, angelos, which means angel like. And those angel-like individuals will be marrying? No, no, no. So these are the all, ones you're talking about. So these are all, this is again, relegated to the heavens. Relegated to the heavens. The marriage will take place on the earth between humans that are born on earth during the millennial period. Uh, they will cohabit and will have a baby boom at the second coming because the earth is going to be repopulated by humans, which will be overseen by the sons of God, which will be angel-like. Now, we said the principle is, Scripture teaches those who yield to the desires of the new creation fully will become the Lord's inner circle, seated on his right hand. Turn to Philippians, first chapter, verse 23. <clears throat> Okay, everybody there? Yep. Well, I'm in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. 
Paul is saying, I've reached the stage where I'm between two. I have a desire just to leave the earth to go to be with my Lord and Savior. But I'm not going to do that because it's more needful for me to be with you, church, to give you understanding and instruction. So I'm going to delay my departure. What is this saying? That in Christ you reach a stage where you can willfully leave the earth, shut it down, and go to be with the Lord. Turn to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Fifth chapter. <coughs> Verse eight. <coughs> we are confident. He's saying, I have a confidence, I say, and willing, a desire, <clears throat> rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Paul is telling him in uncertain terms. He's reached the stage where he can dismiss his inner man and go into the heavens to be in the presence of, where would he go? At the throne of the Lord. He's an overcomer. Look at uh, verse one and two, same chapter. Paul is talking all dedicates a whole chapter to this. We know that if an earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, sigh, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with the house which is from heaven. Paul is telling us a principle when you reach a stage where you are yielded to the desires of the inner man who was created for the heavens, not the earth. You pick up his desire. And he says, <clears throat> earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with a house which is from heaven. He's talking about a celestial body. If so, being clothed, we should not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan. Being burdened, not that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. What is he saying? He's saying the desire of the inner man, the new birth, the new creation, is to inhabit the region for which he was created. That's his desire. That's what he was created for. He goes on. Now he that had wrought us for the self same thing is God, who hath also given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. He goes on to say, we reach a stage where we have a confidence, and we, therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing, whether to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So he lays it out in no uncertain terms. This is the inner circle. This is the level at which the prototokos group that reaches this level will be the, become the overseers, the angels of the churches in the pre-rapture era. Yes. There's a saying attributing to John the Baptist. And um, of this generation, of Paul's generation, I think the same scripture can be used and, and, and further. Of men born of a woman, there hath none, nothing, no one's raised greater than John the Baptist. Paul, he's raised of a woman. He's greater than John the Baptist in my perspective from my, uh, his generation. I'm talking about there's two ge generation, difference of generations. Two covenants, yeah, the old covenant and the new covenant. Jesus is talking about the old covenant, the law. He says, in that, under that stat, status, there had been nobody greater than John the Baptist. Nevertheless, he that is in the kingdom, New Covenant, is least in the kingdom is greater than <laughs> he. That's amazing. That just because of this whole thing here. 
So I'm, I'm looking for a an, a an attribute, a declaration, a recognition of Paul in Scripture, other than me rec realizing and recognizing that he is the one who who's given me the knowledge of the kingdom. Okay, that there's nobody greater than that. I mean, and then, then there's you know. We have to also, the group here, include the messenger. And so, you know, it's, and the messenger is, is that guy I just pointed at. So, you know, it's like, Jonesy, um, an outward declaration of Paul would be nice. But that was his generation. We're in our generation now. And our generation seems to be the last one. By all indications, this is the last one. And, you know, I mean, I we definitely do know that he's a, a member of the Protogos group. And we also definitely do know that he is in the right hand of Christ. Um, <coughs> I guess I got. I just answered my own question. The idea here that we need to focus on is the amazing opportunity that comes under the new covenant relationship in Christ. Paul's generation, Peter's generation, was the initial group that was to start it off. But what we had was the. <clears throat> Interference of the Luciferians. You read about them in Ephesians. Paul warns about them. He says the principalities in heaven. Basically, he says they got wind of the power that now resides in the church. And they pull out all stops to make sure it didn't happen, which is what they did. And the main thing they did was to divide it and then take away its power through its access to the word. So, what's taking place here is the way the Lord des desired it to progress is that Paul's generation were to be the instructors, the teachers of the depth that Paul was revealing in his era, and that was to be built upon so that by now, by now, Prototokia should be common knowledge would be what we're discussing. It isn't. Because of the Luciferian influence. In other words, God's program was restricted. The but thing is, the thing of it is, see, I know our, our calling our calling is higher than the other generations. And that um, we're gonna undergo knowledgeable persecution. <laughs> uh, back then they did they, they had an idea where it was coming from, but now we have that we have knowledge of of the origins and the reasonings and so on and so on and so on. But we've qualified because of the generation that we're in for stronger persecutions. And I'm telling this group right here, and it's not like it's brand new, but Satan is going to do whatever he can to make sure you find a problem with me. He finds a problem with him, he finds a problem with you, and you all find problems with me. <clears throat> so the whole thing is, is literally, we have to know that's going to happen because this is a solid group. This is a strength that's not even imagined, that's sitting right here, right in this house. Satan is not going to waste time on people that aren't figuring this whole thing out the way we have. We can remind him of his end. But the thing of it is, is he's also been given permission to have an effect on us because we're in the development stage of our Prototokos classification, designation. And so we are going, and, and the whole thing is, is um, everything is our reward. It's not in measurement, it's not in quantity, it's not in partial doubt. It's everything. So, 
just by the fact what so um how much suffering yeah. is my part you know how, how much do i have to suffer you know? <laughs> I mean, we try because his opinion wants to quantify and have an, an, an understanding of the beginning and the ending and when i think i'm all done but the thing <laughs> of it is is we got to get rid of the human concept of of time and beginning and ending because we're being everything is ours it's already God's already said it's ours it, it's already a past tense thing he's viewing it from the past in his word it's already a done deal it's a done deal we just got to do is not blow it and we are definitely have opportunity to blow it it says your name will be blotted out of the Lamb's book of life indicating there are some that's going to blow it but the thing of it is is for a strong fortified group as this is right here, it's the primary threat to Satan and his. And so, bear with me on my weaknesses. When I, when I came in here, I was crying on anybody's shoulder that would listen to me about, you know, my day. But I didn't stub my toe, I didn't wet my pants, you know, there, nothing, nothing really serious happened. It was just another day that I wish would have been better. But understand, folks, we're all going to get stronger and stronger persecution. All of us are going to. People are not going to understand our intents. They're going to be distorted to be exactly the opposite of what you're intending for them to know or to feel or to hear from you. Know it. Just know it. It's going to happen, and just don't be surprised when it does happen. Just be confident that the Lord, Lord's watching to see how you're going to handle it. You got all that in the Bible? Yeah. <laughs> you know, Jimmy, there's, there's things that are going on in this group that not all of us know about. Um, and we all need to pray for each other diligently big time. And I do, for some reason, the Father just put it on my heart a few weeks back, that I spend time focusing on Him first, okay? And I pray for His strength, His health. And then I, I ask for the Father to give Him wisdom and understanding. And then I ask for Him to give Jonesy the ability to teach me what He's been given. And then I pray, you know, health, vitality, I, I just cover them. Then I go to Dorothy. I do the same thing. The stress that she endures with that little boy and the, the granddaughter, and, you know, all that stuff. And she's hanging in there, and she's not grieving this man. So there's there's a harmonious thing that's only the only the Lord can be protection. But then this man is in the picture. He is heading up the the ministry. He's heading up the ministry. He's delivering the message. He's heading up the ministry. We're all part of a very significant, dynamic thing that the Father expects us to have a part in. Right. I pray for each one of us, you, him, him, me. I don't pray for myself. I know you guys are praying for me. But I, I pray for Dorothy. I pray for Tanisha that she would understand and realize that the house that she's in is only God. There's nowhere on earth that she would have the liberties <coughs> and liberties she has here, anywhere else. And I just pray that she would understand that and show Dorothy and Josie respect, gratification, and concern. Simple concepts. I just pray that that would be the Father's move. And we need to take time in our prayer lives for each one of us and spend time praying for the individuals as the Father directs you and puts it on your mind. Because literally that is strengthening us. When you're praying for me, I'm getting strengthened, Jimmy. When I'm praying for him, he's getting strengthened. When he's praying for me, I'm getting strengthened. It's vice versa. It's, it's, a, it's a principle that the Father is bringing very clear to me, very loud to me. And so I do it every day now, several times a day. And you know, when I'm driving, if I already got the phone telling me where I'm going, I can be praying about somebody else and not paying attention, you know, 
too much. <laughs> but the thing of it is, is literally, we are strengthening each other by keeping ourselves prayed up. And by doing that, we're staying in, in a bond. We're, we're, in, we're in agreement. And the Father is well pleased with that type of thinking and life. And he will make moves in each one of our lives, showing his pleasure in our lives. Yes, yes. we agree. Yes.